Good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Fundu Info and Shaman Shankar, this is Sheila Ditya Basu welcoming you to our webinar on health, not just healthcare, a data driven approach. A little bit of housekeeping before we start. Uh, please use Ask a Question button at any time to put your questions. However, we'll take all the answers at the end. And as you leave the webinar, please rate it, uh, leave us a feedback, and uh, don't feel free to share it with your team or network. Today our speaker is Kalol Mahata, co-founder and COO of Patient Care Invention Intervention Center, or PCIC. He has a, a degree in chemical engineering and also in computer science with research experience in EMR, electronic uh, medical records. Uh, he also had 10 years experience in the oil and gas industry. Uh, what do you, Kalo? Take it on. Sheila, I um, want to thank both you and Shamant for this, for this opportunity and uh, welcome everybody. So in today's talk, we're going health uh, to be defined as a broader definition, not, not just healthcare, and how does that look from a data-driven approach. Um, a little bit about PCIC, Patient Care Intervention Center. Um, our mission is to improve healthcare quality and cost of the community through two things that we do, through by bringing data together and by coordinating care for patients. Um, Patient Care Intervention Center is a nonprofit uh, 501c3 organization, and all of the work we do, uh, we do under that arm of the nonprofit. So for our agenda today, we're going to really look at three things. We're going to look first at understanding what the problem is. Why do we need to look at health versus healthcare? Then we go, we're going to go into seeing what can we do about it, and the third thing would be, what does the solution look like? And dive in um, to a demo, demo uh, piece of the presentation. So I'm going to start off with a big number that I'm going to throw at you, which is $3.5 trillion. That's the annual spend on healthcare in 2017. Um, and that's a very big number. That's about close to 18% of our GDP, which by itself is not necessarily bad. Um, what we need to look for is for that um, spend, what is the outcome that we get from it. So in this presentation, I'm going to start off with a very high-level global view, uh, bring it to the national level, and then more at the kind of detailed patient level um, to get a better understanding of what the problem is. So we'll start off by looking at a few um, charts. So the first one is to really understand what that spend means. So in this visual, what we're seeing is um, uh, the top OECD countries um, looking at what the total spend is, both on the healthcare side as well as the social care side. So what you will see is the U.S. is actually one of the top spenders in healthcare with a um, you know, 3.5, 3.7 now actually trillion dollars in healthcare spend. But if you look at it as a combined value of the amount we spend on health and social, we're actually um, about sixth um, um, on you know on the top six, not really the top spender. And you have a lot of other countries like France, Sweden, uh, Germany, the Netherlands, who have higher spends um, than us. Um, where we're seeing a difference is that ratio of spend. What, what you're seeing is you know, the, the amount that we're spending on, on our medical health care side is much, much higher than the amount that we spend on our social care side. So what does that look like when we start looking at outcomes globally, right? So being the highest spender in um, on the on the healthcare side, um, we're about two and a half times um, higher spend per capita than you know any other OECD nation. Um, yet, if we start looking at the outcomes of what that spend is getting us, we're really not doing a very good job um, with that per capita spend. So, if you look at, for example, infant mortality. 
we are actually ranked of, you know, 34 OECD nations. If you look at uh, life expectancy, we're ranked, you know, at all the way at the bottom, around 40th. Um, and this chart is a great explanation of that. But these gray bars showing life expectancy, where U.S. is here at all the way at the back, uh, fifth last, whereas that this line bar is showing our per capita spending, and you see we're all the way on the top compared to most other uh, nations. So if we start to look at this at the national level, right, um, what is that misaligned resource look like? Right? So if you look at what is determining, determining health outcomes, there's a lot of study that has gone in this area. And what we see is, you know, 20% of all health outcomes is impacted by medical factors. And about 80% of our health outcomes is impacted by social or behavioral, behavioral and environmental factors. And this is the whole area around social determinants of health um, that is a big focus right now nationally, but also is a big focus for PCIC. Now, on the other side of that chart, if we take a look at what is the spend, if we look, we're spending about a dollar on medical health, but for every dollar that we spend, we spend about 35 cents on social service. So while the impact is highest on the social environment, um, or the impact from social is much higher, our spend on health um, is ends up being much, you know, is much, ends up being much more than what we're spending on social. So what is one of the things that that results in? We end up with a situation where, you know, 5% of the population is accounting for about 50% of the healthcare spend. And so if we stop to think about that, that's about $1.7 trillion is used by about 5% of the population. And so what who, who is that 5% of that population? And that's a group that we've focused on quite a bit, and these are individuals that we call complex patients, and they're patients usually who have multiple medical um, chronic conditions um, and have kind of acute uh, psychosocial and behavioral needs along with that. Um, and so the traditional way in which we are we are handling healthcare now is really not serving this population. We also see that this population, um, the the top causes or the top barriers that they are facing is is three you know top items that are nationally bar national barriers, which is trying to get an appointment, trying to get transportation, and then trying to obtain medication. Now I'm going to start off with a quick story here with a with a client or a patient named uh, client that we call client J. He has visited multiple systems. You will see he has had um, 95 visits to a, a hospital system. Here has been picked up by um, the EMS transport service that provides uh, you know transport uh, emergency transportation to uh, hospitals about 65 times. He was booked six times in the jail, had 44 times, went to the recovery center and 76 arrests, all of this within a one-year time frame, um, resulting in a cost of almost a, 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 a half a million dollars in spend in one year. And so what can we do differently for Mr. J? You know, one of the things we were seeing was, was each of these agencies we're serving Mr. J, but we're not able to see that that he had visits to these other agencies across the community. And so data sharing was a big problem, um, and not knowing where he went was causing the cycling for Mr. J across multiple agencies. So going back a little bit to that the, the idea of social determinants that I was talking about, which is this idea that, or the the, the research that we've seen that clinical care accounts for about 20% of your health factors, and there are these other areas around behavioral health, around social and economic factors, physical environment, that accounts for you know, the remaining 80%. And 
And so we, if we look at this like our recipe, we have the recipe of, of where we should be having our focus and our impact. Um, what where we're missing right now or missing out on right now is putting all our you know ingredients into one area of clinical care and really not focusing on the other ingredients that we really need to focus on um, to have much better health outcomes for the populations within a community. So this is a problem that we are seeing as a, as a community problem. It is not a problem of a single agency or a single hospital system or a social service system that's providing care um, to the population. It's, it's a problem that we're seeing across the community and so our approach has been to see can we, can we have a community solution um, to this problem. So if you remember how our system works right now, you know, we have medical systems, behavioral systems, social systems, and each of these uh, agencies are individually serving the client um, on, a, on a kind of one-on-one -on -one, uh, engagement model. Um, what we have proposed in our building is a much more collaborative model of care where we would bring medical, behavioral, and social systems together through data sharing and through a common communication um, platform so that it's a, it's a aligned and single uh, engagement model with the client um, versus having these one-off relationships where the client is having to start um, with every with 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 every agency engagement with every agency is you know from scratch at every visit. So, if we go back to Mr. J um, in the slide, uh, what are the things that we did differently, right, for Mr. G? So there are four things um, that we did differently. We we brought number one, we brought together data from the medical system with the social service system together into one ecosystem. So bringing this large volume of data um, to understand the needs of client J um, beyond just one system needs, so a community level view um, of, of Mr. J. Helped us identify two things. One is helped identify what the overlaps in care were for him, and two, it has to identify opportunities for intervention um, at these all these different agencies that were that were touching Mr. J. The second thing we did was to develop a values-based model of care to engage with him. So, this is a model of care where we start to understand what, uh, who, or what's important to Mr. J, um, and what would Mr. J like to be doing. Unlike our more traditional model where we start off with a problem statement or a problem list that Mr. J has. Um, we went a slightly different approach to say, can we start with understanding the values that are important, be it his dog or his daughter, um, you know, or, or wanting to walk more, um, and then use that as a pivot to get to the problems or the barriers that are getting in the way. The third thing we did was to connect patients to resources in real time. Um, so to connect the needs of Mr. J to the resources or the agencies that are able to provide those resources in as close to real time as possible. And then these three things really helped identify barriers that were more systemic um, barriers rather than being kind of individual agency level barriers which enables us to now get to a policy level change uh, to really have a true impact. So we go to now, you know, what, what is the solution that we provided? So um, at PCIC, we've developed what's called the Unified Care Continuum Platform. And the focus of this platform is really care performing care coordination across uh, medical and social agencies, rather than the focus on individual agencies, can we have a platform that's kind of bridging uh, the communication mechanism between different agencies. So there are three, um, there are three modules to our platform. The first one is the community data exchange, and that's where we bring this data from multiple ecosystems, um, from, you know, social, behavioral, 
medical systems together um, and we're able to kind of have a much broader view of the needs of, of um, individuals. And this is where we start looking at 360 views uh, for a client. The second piece is a community resource exchange, and that's understanding what are the resources available in a community. Can we map them all out by, you know, having an integrated data set of, of shelters, of hospital systems, of food pantries that are available um, across the community, and then start building these referral mechanisms that are going to be warm referrals and um, kind of warm and, and feedback loops you know, between agencies during a referral process. And the, th the third piece that we built is a community care coordination module, um, which is really looking at the client level uh, engagement, the client level view, um, and the ability to have this care plan that we develop for the client be shared across multiple agencies so we're all on the same page um, of the care that's required um, for, um, for patients and clients. The way we do it is by bringing together three teams. So we have an intervention team um, that's really our lab that is testing out these models of intervention and are working very tightly with our technology team. Our technology team is really two sets of teams. One is our data team working together um, with a technology development team that's actually building the product. Um, so they're working kind of hand in hand with the intervention team, um, getting that tight feedback loop to see what is working in the field and what is not, and then refining the product accordingly. Our third team is our population health team, and they, com they comprise of our research folks as well as our research partners who are really building that evidence base to show that this is going to be a better model for engagement, that having a more collaborative model of care is the, right, is the direction that we need to go to to have a larger impact on this population. Um, here are some of our partners that we work with, and what you will see is we have partners across the board, from health systems to, to university systems to social service agencies and um, governmental agencies kind of working together um, to try and solve the problem. And we have partnerships from a data sharing perspective, from a building care or care coordination perspective, as well as from a research perspective. If we were to look at this kind of aggregation of partners, that's um, about 210 different community partners um, across the community, or 210 unique community partners, who are bringing data in, which accounts for about four, over 14 million records and keeps growing every day. And the kind of longitudinal view of that data is about 565 different data points from these different um, agencies that are touching or that are providing services to a client, all the way from data points from a police department, which may be very different from a hospital system, which may be very different from a uh, you know, insurance provider or payer system. And so part of the work at BCIC is to really see how can we link all these different data points together uh, to have a much better and clearer picture. <clears throat> so at this point, I'd like to switch to a very quick demo of how we do it. Um, and to start that off, I'd like to start actually with, uh, with a um, set of screen prints bringing these very large data sets together. So in this screen print, I'm going to just layer one, one uh, visual on top of the other. We start off by looking at one single system, and we start to understand that population. So in this case, we're looking at um, 388,000 people in one system who have 827,000 visits um, during a five-year time frame. And this first overlap summary really helps us understand, you know, um, a, a group of them, which is that light blues, who uh, really visit one single agency. And so there isn't a big overlap. But then the dark blues below, um, we start to see individuals who are showing up in one other system, two other systems, and so on. So that's the overlap population we start to focus on um, and then bring in the next system on top of it. So from those 
388,000 individuals if we overlap them with the EMS. 100 of them show up um, uh, as being picked up by the emergency uh, medical services um, about 200 and almost 250,000 times, right? And so now we start to see what that overlap is. We, we can now focus in on those 84,000 to understand um, who are the kind of highest need individuals in that population and who are the other partners that are where across the city they're being dropped off at and what are some of the chief complaints of that population. We then overlap the third system, in this case it's a social service agency, and about 8,900 um, 8, individuals from that original 388,000 also showed up in a social service agency, accounting for over 1.3 million visits, right? And so these visuals start to show us where are the individuals visiting, how many different agencies are they having to visit, what are the main services that they're getting um, at those agencies. And then the fourth overlap here we're seeing is an overlap with a food bank here. So we're seeing about 3,200 showed up at a food bank with over 17,000 uh, visits to pick up you know, uh, food from different food pantries. We're looking at where across the city are they picking it up from. Um, and what does that volume look like? And so this is really a starting point for us to understand that very global high-level view of what are the needs um, within a community. I'm going to switch my screen here and go to a live view of our, da of our dashboard. And so what you're seeing here is another way in which we um, are able to visualize where individuals uh, are getting resources from. Kalal, uh, one minute. Uh, just uh, can you reestablish your uh, screen share link, please? Sure. Thank you. Sure. Sorry about that. Um, so. <clears throat> What you're seeing here is, is a, a, another view in which you know, we're starting up with one zip code um, within a community and we're saying based off of the data, where is the population getting services from, right? So um, each of these each of the is pointing to an agency. And so we're starting off with one zip code, 77004, which is a zip code. Um, in Houston called the, the Third Ward. And from there, we're pointing to all the different places where resources exist and where, where individuals or population from that zip code have consumed resources. And so this helps us understand or start to plan out what is needed within a specific, um, within a specific zip code or within a specific community. Um, some key findings that we had was seeing that patients were traveling a lot of the time outside of that zip code for a resource. So you'll see I can, I can hover over each of these to understand, you know, how many individuals had visits to, you know, a hospital center, um, a, a uh, social agency, um, a clinic facility. And it helps us to understand kind of the gaps um, that may exist within a specific zip code or within a specific population as well as what are the biggest needs of that population, just looking at the utilization. Now, if I start to scroll down here a little bit, what you're going to see is from that being the starting point then, we can now come and say, okay, for, that, for the individuals living in that zip code, what is that overlap summary looking like? Um, how many different agencies are they visiting? So we can see now that in this kind of example, it has dropped quite a bit. So we have about 51% that went to one agency, but the remaining 50% went to two or more agencies for the, the services they needed. What does the demographic look like for that population? Um, and then, you know, scrolling further into kind of the details of that service that they needed. So food and meals, housing, case management, 
bathing, personal hygiene, bus fare, transportation. We're looking at a lot of these kind of social needs of that population, um, which we can get from that aggregated data analysis, and that will enable us to design the right model of care that's required for a given population or a given community. So if we were to come kind of dive down a little further into um, the, the patient level views right now, which is what I'm going to bring up for you here, um, how do we track this information? So I'm going to log in here really quickly. And now we've really come down to the patient level data. So in this uh, uh, demo database, what you're seeing is me logging on as a provider um, with this integrated system that's bringing the data from one side from the community data exchange into the, into the platform that's providing care. It's really arming the provider with much more information as to their patients. So this is a list of 15 patients that are on my uh, you know, care, list of patients I'm taking care for, I can see is the intervention having an impact looking at pre-post analysis from a visit perspective and a cost perspective. Um, where across the community is, are my patients going to? What are the different agencies? How far along are we with their care plan? And um, how much time have we spent um, as a group working on this, the, these patients? Um, there's some geomapping to see where across the community they are. And then really now starting to look at what are the top successes, challenges, and barriers we see with that population as well as what resources have we been able to connect. And so what's happening behind the scenes is some extensive textual analysis that's pulling that data out um, and presenting it on a provider level um, or, a, phys or a, a physician's or a care coordinator's dashboard. Um, as a starting point uh, for when, a, when someone logs into the application. So I'm going to go to a specific client record here and show you what it looks like if we were to um, see it from a specific client's view. So I've logged into Monica Sanchez, you know, a fictitious patient on our system. Uh, but what you'll see is when I log into a screen, the first thing on, on the header is two pieces of information that says who or what's important to Monica and what would Monica like to be doing. And you see she has said that my son, my dog, my neighbor Sally is what's important to her and she would like to be taking care of her, her pet um, to take her pet on regular walks and she'd like to be having dinner with Sally. And so it's a very different engagement model to start with that versus to say, okay, what's Monica's problem list? You know, she has diabetes, she has hypertension, um, and so, you know, this is what we need to do. That's a, that that has, has shown to not have as strong of an engagement versus to say, you know, okay, Monica, you want to spend more time with your son, let's see what we need to do. So every provider who logs in is going to start off with that information and then have enough tracking information on the dashboard to truly see, you know, is the care we are providing having an impact um, on, on Monica? We have something, we have different assessments. One of that is called the DLA-20, which is a quality of life instrument, which is saying, are we having an improvement in the quality of life over time as we're engaging with this patient? And so it's really using data and making it be actionable um, at the point of care with the patient. The other big um, differentiator that you're going to see is the idea of care teams. If you remember in the presentation we spoke about having a care plan that we can share across different agencies or different organizations. Now, this is very much a social care plan for the patient, and so it goes beyond you know, diagnosis and beyond clinical case note, it's looking at what are, you know, Monica's needs uh, for, for her transportation or food. Um, and so that information can be provided to agencies across the community that can support Monica. So you'll see the idea of a care team, which when I click on it, we're going to see the different members in Monica's care team. And I can see the different team members as well as which agency they're from. So there's three team members from PCIC and then one team member from Star of Hope that's supporting Monica. 
And as we start to work on Monica's care plan, if there are other agencies that we need to bring on board, we can always you know, make a request from the platform. So what the platform's done is it's already, it already knows what the partnerships are behind the scenes between agencies that are working together, and it's automatically going to show which additional agencies I can add to Monica's care plan. Um, so that's how we are tracking uh, you know, uh, individuals in the system and having a much more of an accountable um, um, kind of workflow to support um, patients. We have integrated this idea of patient values-based model of care, which is a, cogn a cognitive behavioral therapy model-based um, uh, idea to engage patients better. And so this is the screen we engage them in. We start off with actually asking who what's important to you. And then as they are saying it, we're, we're kind of gathering that information and entering it and giving it a little tag. So it, 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 it's uh, more engaging when we share it with the patient. Um, we track their aspirations, what would they be like to be doing. You know, Monica said eating three times a day, having dinner with Sally. And then the third item at the bottom is really saying, you know, what's getting in the way of, of, uh, of Monica's trying to achieve her goals or, or her values, and we start tracking that. So you'll see her barriers. She lacks a cell phone. She lacks access to reliable transportation. Um, she lacks affordable housing. And so what we start to do is then create goals in the system to start to track each one of those barriers and to start to overcome those barriers by creating action steps that either the patient, the provider, or another team member from an, another agency can help um, solve. Now, throughout this process, we are, we are um, uh, tracking the engagement, and part of it is also the referral piece that has to be done. So what you will see is with, during a visit that we have or our partners have with a patient, they can track um, what goals that they're working on on that visit, but they can also start connecting it up to resources that may be required. So I can start, if I need, you know, transportation services, I can start searching for that resource here or go to a larger resource directory where I can say I need to find transportation services. It's going to populate it with Monica's zip code by default, and I'm going to look within a five-mile radius to see what are my options uh, to connect Monica to. Um, and when I select a specific resource, I can go ahead and add it to Monica's care plan. And so depending on partnerships that may already exist between agencies, um, this kind of information will get sent to the respective agency to say, hey, we're trying to find you know, transportation for Monica. Is this something that uh, we can send a referral to, to, that specific, to you or to the specific agency uh, to assist in Monica's care? Um, so this is the mechanism in which we are kind of, we've come down now to that detailed patient level tracking um, to, to really kind of push how, push the boundary on how we can provide better care um, to patients, especially to complex patients, um, you know, like Monica, who have really high needs both on kind of both on the medical side, but uh, a large amount or a high amount of needs also on the social side and the behavioral health side. So that's a little bit about the system um, at the kind of tracking level. Um, I'm going to switch back really quick. to my presentation deck here. Um, and kind of reiterate uh, what we just said. So the, the focus areas of our conversation today was looking at, um, you know, where are we having a challenge in the healthcare system, uh, despite the fact that we have such a big spend of $3.7 trillion, um, we're not really having the kind of impact that we should really be having. Um, we then looked at what social determinants of health are and how they impact a client, especially focusing on complex clients who are patients that are clients that have very high needs 
um, and are individuals that usually have more than one chronic condition along with social and behavioral needs. We then looked at how we can analyze this data at a systems level, bringing together data from multiple agencies, not just healthcare, but health, social, you know, governmental, behavioral health, uh, bringing that together into one data ecosystem to get a 360-degree view of the patient um, and, and have a care plan that's more informed. Um, and then we looked at, from there, we looked at two sets of visuals. One is what does an overlap analysis look like, bringing together data from you know, five, six, seven different agencies and overlaying one above the other, and a patient, more detailed patient level view of how can we have a, a model of care that is very different, that is uh, more about engagement integrated into a patient level tracking platform and the ability to have warm referrals um, between systems. So I'm going to stop there and, and take any questions. Thank you, Kalon, for a very uh, informative and uh, expansive introduction to PCIC and uh, what the new days are going to bring us. Uh, I'm sure a lot of folks uh, can relate uh, when we go to different uh, providers, like when you change your PCP maybe or you know go to a new uh, specialist. Every time you're going to fill up the same three sheets of paper with uh, 1,500 questions that you have already answered. Uh, so yeah, if uh, if we can get all these things together and uh, kind of take a uh, system-wide view as you are trying to do here, that would be really great. Uh, I just got a comment from one of the audience members. Uh, uh, she is congratulating you for the presentation, and she also mentioned that she had worked with Mother Teresa for three years, living in the environment day in and day out to seeing these things firsthand. Is, uh, and her question is, is Secretary Azar and Seema Varma aware of this project? I am uh, I did not get those two names. Um, uh, it's the, the Health and Human Services Secretary, Secretary Azar and uh, Seema ah, Varma. Gotcha. Um, so there's been talks at the, I have not connected with either of them at the national uh, level. Um, yeah. yeah, so there's there's been quite a bit of work in this area of, you know, complex patients and high needs, high cost patients nationally. Um, we have really pushed, um, pushed the work here, both in Houston and in Texas, um, and are working with a number of national partners. Um, you mm -hmm. know, in New, New Jersey, we have a couple of partners um, to, to kind of understand how across different cities or different states um, this work can continue to be built um, to provide a, a solution that, that can actually scale and be replica replicable in multiple cities. Okay, that's great. Um, so what are some of the challenges you saw while you were trying to get these different partners from different, so basically trying to get the data from hospitals to the court system and the justice system uh, did you did you see any problems or did they were they very receptive of the idea i mean um so when we started it off you know we we've, we've seen it, it took a while to get momentum you know to be able to have the large number of partners we have um I think initially the, the biggest challenges around any kind of data sharing initiative is trust building. Right. Um, and so establishing uh, trust with every agency, really one agency at a time, is where we started off. And okay. it took a while to get there, but over time, you know, we had critical mass. Um, and once you start to have uh, a group of agencies working together, uh, you, you start to get enough critical mass to be able to push the needle um, towards getting other agencies on board. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the areas we, you know, starting off around data sharing can be uh, no, a little scary, especially for security officers uh, in agencies. Um, but building that trust, building the, the, the security structures and 
and policies in place to be able to protect this large volume of data is something that you know we've had to put a lot of focus on. Okay, okay, that, that's really great. Yeah, another another member uh, writes us that uh, they have studied the social determinants of health for some time and would like to know more about what you do and how you do it. So I think that's more of a comment, or would you like to take that, Kalal? Um, <clears throat> sure. So there are some amazing folks across, you know, nationally who have done who have done and are continuing to do studies on social determinants of health. Um, there is a lot that can be done. I think it's become a buzzword. SDOH, or social determinants of health, has really become a buzzword now um, nationally. Uh, but this is work that we've been doing, and a lot of agencies have been doing for a, for a lot of years already. Um, I think the number one trying to build collaborative partnerships in a community is something mm -hmm. um, that is a big need right now, uh, not just you know locally here in Houston or in the U.S., but I think um, in in pretty much every every state and as well as globally. Um, I think also um, starting to have have a very kind of evidence-based, data-driven approach to the work is important. Um, I think at the core of what we do, we make sure that anything that's built is built with with the the really strong evidence that's required to show that mm. something is working, um, especially around social determinants of health. So having not just data, uh, but data that can be actionable is really important. Uh, and that kind of brings me to the next question, but before that, uh, I'll, uh, I'll give a shout out to one of the audience members. Uh, if you can share your contact information, this person, that would be great. Uh, they mentioned that they they know Secretary Azar and Secretary Vama as friends and will alert them about this amazing pro project. Thank you very much. That would be really kind of you. But uh, do let us know who you are so that uh, the speaker can be, get in touch with you. And another question came out as, do they need funding? And I think I know the answer to that, Kalol, but I'll let you answer it. <laughs> um, that's, uh, thank you for that question. Um, yes, I think, you know, this is working in, in, the, in the nonprofit sector with a, with a topic like this or an area like this where we're so much in the bleeding edge of, of trying to bring technology mm -hmm. um, together with healthcare uh, but trying to do it in a way that we keep to our mission and to the vision and having an agency that's really mission driven and and focused on on that approach versus a more um, you know a model around uh, maybe a for profit model is is mm -hmm. one that we have purposely not done because we want our incentives to stay aligned and so yes we're we we uh, get our a lot of our funding from you know grants, for example, uh, both local philanthropic grants as well as national grants, um, but as well as contracts that we do um, on contractual work for systems, uh, hospital systems um, across you know the community. So um, there's a split of about 60, 40, 60 percent coming from philanthropic funds and 40 percent from uh, contracts. Um, and so, yes, we're always uh, uh, working on, on uh, funding. Okay, good. And uh, that would be great. And uh, another question came in. Uh, do you think approaching primary care physicians would be a first point of contact? No, oh, that's a great question. Um, so, yes, I think, you know, one of the things we're always trying to do in reducing um, um, you know, unnecessary use, for example, of emergency room or admissions is really having patients be connected up to primary care. Um, a lot of the patients that we see in that are high need, high cost, or complex patients, um, you know, have a primary care, um, and and preventative care is is not you know the the first priority on their list. Remember that these are individuals who mm -hmm. are having. Are always having competing priorities and having Sophie's choice 
to make, right? So do I right. go to my primary care doctor or do I pick up food for my kids? Um, or, you know, do I, do I uh, take this extra shift at work? And so it's always this constant, um, you know, choice of, of do I do A or B? And so anything that is preventative in nature or, or um, you know, have, keep having a primary care, uh, it really falls, becomes secondary. So our model in the intervention, for example, is, you know, during that six-month phase where we're engaging with the patient um, and we are uh, building trust but also educating the patient, our ultimate goal is to always connect them up to the most appropriate primary care home for that client. So whether it's a, whether it's a primary care provider, whether it's, you know, uh, they need, you know, dedicated uh, uh, nursing services. They need, you know, uh, uh, housing to be a big, big their biggest need. We're always in the process of connecting them up to the most appropriate um, kind of accountable agency that can continue mm -hmm. on their long-term care. Okay. Okay. So, uh, how, what are some of the outcomes that you saw? I mean. You have you have been working at it uh, for a little bit, and uh, so once you have implemented this uh, holistic approach, how much of an improvement, or what do you see happening to the person? Um, <clears throat> could you repeat that question again? Actually? Yeah. So, Sorry. what are some of the outcomes you have seen outcomes. implementing okay. the value-based model of care? Got it. Great. Um, so, you know, we've one of the models that PCIC is all to always continuously iterate. Um, and so um, we, we take a model, we, uh, we you know, implement it, and then we continuously refine it. Um, so <clears throat> with each iteration, there's different outcomes that we have seen, right? So the biggest outcomes we are tracking is reduction in cost, reduction in, um, you know, cost, unnecessary costs, I should say, to, you know, like emergency room visits, reduction in visits, um, and in quality of life. So on an average, we see about 16% improvement in the quality of life of, of patients, which we again measure through validated instruments. We see an average in aggregate of about 33% reduction in emergency room visits and cost to emergency room systems. Now, as we have refined our model, what we have seen is this steady growth um, from a retention, client retention rate as an example of about 40% uh, with, that we started off with to about 81%, which is where we are right now. It's almost doubling of that uh, by having a mechanism of engagement that is, um, you know, around this values-based piece, values-based model. So a huge change in how we're able to engage with the client. In addition to that, we are constantly running evaluations using kind of very specific assessments that we may perform with the client. So if we want to measure, for example, engagement between the provider and the patient, and that's a big piece that we're looking at to see are we having an improvement in that engagement, um, you know, with this newer model of, in, uh, newer model of values-based scale. Uh, because if, if you think about it, healthcare is one of the few industries where, you know, a feedback loop from the consumer doesn't exist. Um, back to the system providing the service. Everywhere else, we'd take an Uber driver a list, and you know, with instantaneous feedback 